Okay. I uh, want to thank you guys for coming. And also, I just want to say thank you for putting up with the stuff we got to do these days, the temperature, the mask, and things like that. I know it's not very convenient, but uh, we want to be the best neighbors we can be right now. And hopefully, we'll get through this before too long. But again, thank you for the extra things. Uh, taped off pews. Some of you may not be sitting in your assigned seats that you, you know, are used to. And I know that's a little different, but I'll tear the tape off these first four rows if you want to come closer and you can be a rebel today. How about that? But uh, we're glad that you're here today. Today's going to be a great day because all the negative stuff we've had all week long, we're going to come in here, we're going to get uh, re-energized here. We're going to push some of that stuff out and let the Lord speak to us today. So I'm going to ask you, as usual, uh, the last couple of weeks that you would do like we do when we see our neighbors across the, the field or driving by. Just kind of stand up and wave at each other. No hugs, no smooching, none of that stuff right now. We got to hold off, but one of these days we're going to be back to it. So if you'd stand and go and just kind of greet everybody around you.
Amen and amen. Brad, come pray for us, brother. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you today so grateful for the opportunity to come into your house, Lord, and humbly worship you. Lord, we're thankful for each member that's here today and those that are joining us at home. Lord, we pray that you just fill this place, Lord. Cultivate our hearts so that we can receive your message, Lord. And Lord, I just pray that we draw near to you. I pray all these things in your holy name. Amen. Amen and amen. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, God gave him the name that is above every other name. Jesus Christ is Lord. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let's worship as we sing.
amen and amen. You may be seated. Doc, you come. Without guilt or pain, so oft abandoned by our transgression. If such a thing as grace exist, the grace was made for lives like this. There are no strangers, there are no out. There are no orphans of God. So many fallen, but hallelujah. There are no orphans of God. Come ye unwanted and find affection. Come all ye weary, come and lay down your head. Come ye unworthy, you are my brother. If such a thing as grace exists, the grace was made for life. It's like this There are no strangers There are no outcasts There are no orphans of God So many fallen Well, hallelujah There are no orphans of God. Oh, blessed Father, look down upon us. We are your children. We need your love. We run before your throne of mercy and seek your faith to rise above there are no strangers there are no outcasts there are no orphans of God so many fall There are no strangers. There are 
Very good. Just the way I practiced with you, Doc. Just the way I practiced with you. Thank you all. Okay, if you take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 5, we've been going through the Beatitudes. And I thought this was an appropriate series that the Lord led me to, seeing how the attitudes of our world right now are all different. Um, it's almost like a Geiger scale measuring a, a uh, earthquake. You see people's emotions are all over the place, and many of you have a lot of apprehensions in your life of not knowing what to do or, you know, how, to, how do we channel through these waters we're going through today? You know, what's, what's going to happen in the next five, what, six months? We're 100 days from an election uh, today which could change a lot of things, which could cause a lot of more problems into our country and things like that. So we have some uncertain days ahead of us. But the good thing is, is Jesus wrote about those days, and he told us how to handle those. And the very first thing that he told us is take it one day at a time, okay? Take it one day at a time. Don't worry about tomorrow or the next couple of days because he says today has enough problems in itself. How many of y'all had a little issue this morning trying to figure out what you're going to wear today? You wanted to look nice, and so you were going through your closet, and you're going, no, this looks good. No, I, I don't want to wear this. Maybe I look too thin in this one, and I really don't want to show off how thin I am, so I'm going to go to this one. And you had a decision to make. Uh, maybe you, this morning, y'all talked about, what are we going to do after church today? What, are we going to gather with some folks? Are we going to go eat? Are we going to shelter in? Are we, what are we going to do today? You had lots of decisions. So this morning, as we look at the Fourth beatitude, we have looked at blessed are the poor in spirit because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And what that meant, that means all these build on each other. Jesus is teaching disciples. He's not teaching the unsaved. He's on the side of the Mount Capernaum and the sea is behind him. Picture, many of you love to go to the beach. Picture the waves, the sound of the waves that you hear when you're on the beach and the water rolling in. And it's such a peaceful time. Many of you love to dig your toes in the sand and just soak up that sun. That ain't for me. I, I love air conditioner. <laughs> you, I love to dig my toes into the carpet where the air conditioner's blowing on me. That's for me. I like the mountains. I like it where it's cool at times, you know, and feel the cold breeze. I enjoyed our time when I went with the senior adults to the cove. But to be poor in spirit was the very first thing that Jesus is teaching. And he had said prior to this, he says, unless your religion, unless your relationship surpasses that of the Pharisees, you're not going to get into heaven. And what he was talking about in a nutshell, he says, they are fake. All they are is, is religious on the outside, and all they care about is their do's and their don'ts and their rules. And he says, unless your religion surpasses that, you're going to be stuck and you're not going to make it into heaven. So he starts giving us these ways, and these are kind of tips on how to live. And when he says you're to be poor in spirit, it means that you understand, number one, that's where he starts, is that you are bankrupt spiritually. That when you finally understand that you are a sinner that is lost, and that there's a holy God, and your eyes are open to that, you understand that you have nothing to offer to him. So you come as a beggar to him, and you say, Christ, I need you as my Lord and Savior. I have a void inside of my heart. I have a, all kinds of issues in my life, and I've tried everything that there is, and there is nothing that's going to fill that void but you. You understand that you are poor, that you are bankrupt in spirit. And he says, if you will do that, the kingdom of heaven will be yours. And what he means, you'll be saved. You'll be going to heaven. One of these days, hopefully, all of us will be in heaven before uh, too long. I don't want you to go this week. I don't want you to go next week. Unless it's the rapture, and we look forward to that time. The second thing he says in verse 4, he says, Blessed are those who mourn because they will be comforted. What does he mean by that? He's talking about that once you get saved, your heart changes. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you, and because the Holy Spirit is living inside of you, he pricks you when you do things wrong. Some of you remember growing up in church. I didn't grow up in church. I got saved, you know, around age 30 or so, and I didn't grow up into a church family. I had good parents and good family, but we didn't grow up in the church. But some of you remember those days of squirming in the pew next to your parents, and they pinch you. They give you that little pinch behind the arm back here, or they give you that look, and it's like, you better stop. You know, you get those things. Well, that's what it means to mourn, because you, you are understanding that your sin has, has caused an issue with God. 
and you're upset about that sin. It bothers you that you're sinning. It bothers you that you have said things and done things. It, and that's the conviction of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And you won't feel that unless you get saved first. And he says, when you do that, when you understand your sin, grieves God first and has side effects, uh, collateral damage to others, it should mourn you. It should grieve you inside of your heart to want to get right with God. And then he says, blessed are the gentle because they will inherit the earth. Okay? So today we're going to look at number four. We're going to look at what it says here. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they will be filled. Okay? So if you would stand, we will look at this one, read it together, and kind of work our way down it. And I just read it for you, so it's going to be easy to read again. Okay? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Remember, he tells you what you need to do, and he says, if you will do that, you will be blessed. You will be filled. And we all like to be filled. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We just ask that you guide and direct us in it and that you comfort us. We need to be filled with your presence. Speak to us today. It's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. So again, when we talk about the Beatitudes, you take away the B, really, and it's the attitudes we are to have as Christians and not everyone that's a Christian has the attitudes of Christ. And that's what he's teaching. He says, you come with your own shortcomings, with your failures. And my job is like if you were to buy an old house and it needs some work on it, that's basically what we are. We're an old house when we get saved. And Jesus comes in and he says, okay, I got great plans for you. We're going to tear this wall out. We're going to take care of this. We're going to move all this trash out and put it in the dumpster. And we're going to totally reinvent uh, reinvent uh, the way you look, the way you act, and the way you speak. And he's teaching us to adapt these levels, uh, adapt these attitudes, because we're to go to another level, okay? You don't just get saved and that's it. He's telling you that once you get saved, that's the start of your journey. Once you get saved, that's, saved, that's the beginning point. And that because you have the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you, you should start progressing, you know, if you've seen a baby, and many of you have been babies at one time, is that true? True statement, you were once a baby, or were you just kind of born and you're now old, okay? You were once a baby, right? And a baby's got to learn things, right? A baby learns with their sensories of their hands. They like to put stuff in their mouth. They learn how to smile. They learn how to do things based on being taught. If you just had a baby and just kind of left them alone, and didn't teach them how to grow and mature in their life, they would be stunted and they would be strange. They would be awkward. They wouldn't be what they were intended to be. And the same holds for us as Christians. Once you get saved, if all you do is just come and sit and don't try and grow in your faith, whether individually with you and the Lord, or that's some of your greatest uh, growth is going to happen. You have the same teacher I have. You have the same person that can share all the truths of the Bible that I share with you. I'm not anything special up here. I'm just sharing what he shares with me out of the overflow that I get each week. And you have that same Holy Spirit. Children have that same Holy Spirit. They don't get a little bitty Holy Spirit, and then as they grow, the Holy Spirit grows. They get the same size all of us gets, the same exact powerful Holy Spirit. And so as you're growing in Christ, he's pointing out to us that the problem is that many people settle. We're, we're a lazy bunch of people, right? We settle for a lot of things. We settle in our families. We settle in our jobs. We settle in our spiritual life. And Jesus says, if you do this, it's because most of the time you have a bad attitude. Things are never going to get better. I'm always going to be a failure. I'm always going to come up short with God. God knows what I've done. And he isn't happy about that. And you just kind of settle and you go, I'll just kind of kind of creep through life and then at the end, I'm going to slide into heaven with the flames burning my tailcoats as I go in, but I'm in. And he says, that's not the way I want you to live. I've got so much more for you. I want you to live an abundant life down here. And you say, well, how do you live an abundant life in this world? Because it's depressing. Turn on any news media or, or see any scenes. All we get fed is negative stuff about fear and the world is falling on you. Well, let me tell you what it says in here. It says you win. 
And the world gets better and better. This is the worst it's going to be for those of us who know Jesus Christ. This is the best it's going to be, this world, for those that do not know Christ. That's always something key to remember. So when we get to this beatitude here, a blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. We all like to be filled. How many of y'all are kind of like, you know, uh, Tracy? I saw Tracy do this one time. I'm going to rat on her at the gas station. You know where you go in there and you get a soda? And it's the soda machine that you fill up. You get your ice and you get your cup. And I saw Tracy do this. I really did. And she, she filled her cup up. And as she started to walk away, she drank half the cup. And then she decided to go back and fill it up again. That's, it's, that's Tracy. Yeah, that's Tracy. No, I'm just kidding. It wasn't Tracy. It was Jamie. Anyway. <laughs> but you, 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 you just kind of want to cheat a little bit, don't you? Say, well, you know, it doesn't cost him that much for me to top this thing off before I go to the store. And, and so you, you want it filled to the top. Or maybe when you go to a buffet line and you, you say, well, I'm really not that hungry. And you got food falling off both sides of the plate. It's stacked up like the Tower of Babel as you're going to the table. And they tell you you can go back, you know, for more. But you say, well, I might not make it back, so I better get all I can. We like things full, don't we? When you go to the gas pump, how many of you are kind of crazy like me? I've got to have the perfect pump. I think Seinfeld did a show on this where you're pumping, and it's got to be on an even number when you stop. $25, it can't be $23.31. That just doesn't work. So you'll sit there and you'll squeeze and squeeze. And, and what it does sometimes is the person on the other side of the pump, it cuts theirs off. And they don't like that. But you're sitting there and you go, okay, 25.84. I can make it to 26. I want the perfect number, perfect number. And then when you get to 26, what they figured now is they bump it to 26.01 when you get close because they want you to try and get another gallon in. See, they're smart. But we like to be filled. We like to be filled. You remember the song we used to sing and the church is way, way back, called Higher Ground. And it was written by a guy, a guy named Johnson Oatman. And one of the uh, stanzas is in it, it says, Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for that higher ground, that next level as we follow Christ. And the Beatitudes are given to us so that we might live on that higher ground. If we just live in the flesh and live but what Jimmy thinks we ought to do, we're never going to achieve, we're never going to make a difference in this world. So each Beatitude, because it starts with the word blessed, Jesus is telling you, if you will adapt my mindset and my traits, you will be blessed, you will be filled, you'll be happy, you'll be comforted, and the kingdom of heaven will be yours. The only lasting joy that comes in this world is by living a life fulfilled, knowing Christ and adapting our thinking and our living to his truth. You know, yesterday we got to do something we haven't done in a long time. You know, this, I don't know if you realize where all this social distancing has come from. And it's a good thing because we do have a serious virus going on. And they're closing churches and telling them, you know, I saw this list of things that said the most contagious places to catch the virus. You know what number one was? The church. For some reason, the virus likes churches more than any other place, like malls, riots, things like that. The church likes viruses. And what you see is not man, although man's making some of these rules. You see the enemy behind all this. Because he knows we, we miss that. We miss the fellowship, we miss the hugging, we miss the, the times together. And yesterday we got a little taste of what we used to do. Where we quit worrying about stuff and we just served people that came up. Uh, we did a fundraiser yesterday of hamburgers and hot dogs. And I'm going to tell you, if you ate one of those hamburgers and hot dogs, your chances of catching COVID-19 have drastically dropped down. Because those were special anointed hamburgers and hot dogs that we cooked. If you had to, you, uh, you're you ready to walk on water. Just go to the lake and start crossing the water. But it was neat to be able to forget about all the stuff, just take some time out. Yeah, it was hot and sweaty, but we stood out there and we passed out things to him, and we are close to, where's John? How much? 
Almost $5,000 we've raised for Pickwick Southside School yesterday, which is a great, great ministry. They're great to us, and so we, we look forward to giving that gift. And thank you for those that participated in that. There's still time if you want to do that. Uh, it's $25. The reason we did it is there's $25 a kid, and they have a little over 200 students, and they have to, they're guessing on what the supplies are going to cost per student. And poor teachers, they got enough stress dealing with, you know, junior, junior, and all these other kids. Now they've got to wipe down tables. Now they got to worry about your kid getting sick and a parent chewing them out, or even worse, a kid catching something even bad, or a teacher getting sick. And so we wanted to do something to just kind of encourage them. Thank you again for doing that. So the word in Beatitudes, the very first word is blessed. And as I said, it only comes through, number one, knowing Jesus Christ. Yes, you can be happy and you can be blessed. And you hear people say, you know, boy, you sure got a great life. Well, I'm blessed. Well, if the roots to that aren't in Jesus Christ, aren't connected back to him, you're really not blessed. You're just having a good moment at the time. To be truly blessed doesn't have anything to do with the physical stuff. It's all about the spiritual, that inside of my mind, I know every good and perfect gift that I get comes from Jesus Christ and himself. And so when I walk around and I see people smile, when I be able to, am able to do something good for someone, when I'm able to make a difference, and maybe it's just encouraging someone. I've got a lot of people that's, that's chins are down these days, and they don't know what to do. They're scared. And you want to know who those folks are, just go to the grocery store and walk down the wrong aisle where the, where the arrows are, and you'll run into them. Don't wear a mask. You know, it's, it's a proper thing to wear a mask because, you know, you're being a good neighbor to others and things like that. But if you don't wear a mask, you'll find out who's scared real quick and who gets really short with you. They're, they're fearful, and they, they ought to be fearful, but there's something that's much more dangerous than this COVID-19, than the other things that are taking place in our world. And that's to die, Jesus says, in your sins without a personal relationship with him. And I think that's what a lot of this fear is. I think it's because people are uncertain if something happens, what's going to happen to me? So, we go to these words of Jesus because they're meant to encourage us. Each one, again, like I said, says, it begins with the word "bless," which means happy or that you're be filled with joy. Many of us, our joy tanks are empty. Our joy tanks are empty because our worry tanks have drained them. And many Christians don't live with joy because either they're not uh, wanting to or they're unaware that most of these joys that we have in our life are from adapting Jesus' mindset. Because no matter what you're going through, with Christ, he can bring you through it, and you can have joy, you can have contentment in that. Again, so today we're talking about being hungry and thirsty, and when I st said the word hungry, some of y'all already started thinking, all right, man, you got about 10, 20 minutes, and we're going to be challenged somewhere. My belly's hungry, it's, it's roaring at this time, and we've got to adapt our, mi our mindset to what Jesus is talking about in this passage about being hungry and thirsty. Again, to be poor in spirit are those who depend only on God that are spiritually bankrupt. To be happy about those who mourn are those speaking about your godly sorrow over your sin. And blessed are the meek, Jesus says, those that are humble and resign themselves and die to themselves, then they will understand the next one that comes down the pike here. And that's those that are hungry and thirst. You remember the old song? Jeff, I know, probably has this album. I Can't Get No Satisfaction. Have you played that lately? Okay. You know why he couldn't get any satisfaction? I'm not talking about Jeff. I'm talking, was it Mick? <laughs> was it Mick that sang that? Okay, Mick Jagger sang that song. I Can't Get No Satisfaction. You know why he couldn't get no satisfaction? Because he was looking for it in the wrong place. There's many people in the world right now that are looking for satisfaction in the wrong place. And then they're coming up empty. They're, they, it's always something next that they got to do or they got to have to find satisfaction. They think, you know, if I just go here at this place and vacation, I'm going to be happy. And then they get back from vacation, they say, what? I need a vacation from my vacation because I'm worn out. 
Or they think, if I can just get this next degree, if I can just make this next goal at work, I'll be happy. And then they get that and they go, well, gosh, I didn't realize all the stress that was going to come with this. They can't get any satisfaction because they're looking for it in all the wrong places. And Jesus reveals to us that becoming a Christian doesn't mean that we become all that he desires for us to be. Once you get saved, you're not, I wish it was that way. I wish it was that way that when, you know, and we tell people sometimes, man, if you'll just get right with Jesus, everything will be taken care of. And that's yes and no. Yes, your salvation will be taken care of. Yes, when you go through things, you'll be able to weather through them. But that doesn't mean that the trials and the hardships and all those things aren't going to come to you. They're not going to come knocking on your house. You're going to have people die. You're going to have people get sick in your life. You're going to have financial problems. You're going to have people that become enemies that were close friends at one time. All those things are going to take place just like they do for everyone else. But the difference is Jesus says that you'll be able to go through those things because he will teach you how to do those. He will build you up from the inside. You know, Paul tells us when we get saved, he says we are babes in Christ. And that we desire milk, and we need to get off the milk and get on to the meat. And we're all called to grow and mature in Christ. Yes, you're saved, and you're secure. Once you get saved, you can't lose your salvation. Yes, once you're saved, you're heaven-bound. Your ticket's been punched. You don't have to worry about that anymore. So what do we do while we're here? waiting. Wouldn't it be nice if we just get baptized and God says, okay, we're done here. They're going home. He doesn't do that because there's a purpose here. The purpose is, is we got to live here, and the Bible calls us pilgrims and strangers. And Paul says in Philippians 3, he says that this isn't our home. You ever been somewhere on a trip, and you're like, I'm just ready to go home, get in my bed. I'm just ready to get back to my simple things. This is just too crazy. This trip hadn't gone well. It's just been, it's crazy. And I'm just ready to get home. Well, that's the way a Christian ought to feel as we walk around this world saying, yes, I'm on this mission. I'm doing this job God's called me to do, but I'm ready to go home. I'm ready to get to where he has for me, to see that homeland that he has to me. So how are we to live? How are we to enjoy God, while we are here, and how are we to live the fruitful life? Again, life can be frustrating because you are not guaranteed not to have pain and sorrow. And that's a, that's a great argument for someone that's not a Christian. They say, well, you tell us your life's going to be perfect when you get saved, so why should I, you know, join you in the Christian faith because my life isn't having any of the problems you're having. And you sit back and you go, well, even though all these things are going on, God decided just like he did with Job, he looked down and he says, I'm going to show the world through you how strong I am. And you're going to be able to send a great witness to people. That's one of the greatest witnesses that we see in the world today when somebody succumbs to something very tragic and they make their way through. And I don't know if you've listened to the press secretary for uh, Trump's testimony that they posted this past week on the internet. Amazing. Absolute amazing. Put the politics aside, and as a Christian, just listen to her story, her talking about Jesus, her upbringing, and how he's brought her through some miraculous things, and her faith is so strong in those things. When some people would have said, why me, God? Why did you allow these things to happen in my life? Very, very strong. So again, we're not immune to the things that take place. So the Bible says that it rains on the just and the unjust. The difference is Those that are just, and what I mean by that, those that have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, they weather through. They learn from that experience. You know, I've talked to many of, some of you with some uh, gray hair that have gone through different things in your life, and we talk about what we're going through right now, and you say, oh, Jimmy, this is nothing. I've made it through different stuff before, and, and this is just a bump in the road. The older you get, the more you're not surprised when things like this happen. So just hang in there. It's, it's all going to work itself out. Things may be a little different, but, you know, we're going to be okay. We've weathered these storms before. And so how are we as believers to have victory, joy, and peace in this life? Well, that's what the Beatitudes teach us. Your attitude determines a lot of things. If your attitude is poor, woe is me, my life's a mess, God doesn't love me, he doesn't care about me, he's not speaking to me, you're going to be a miserable person. 
And God's not going to be able to speak to you because you're so full of yourself and so full of the misery in your life that he's looking to fill you. So that's when he says, blessed are those who are what? Hunger and thirst for righteousness. What do you got to be to be hungry? What do you got to be? You got to be empty. Some of you come home and your spouse or somebody will call you and you go, hey, let's go eat. And you go, I had a big lunch. No way I can feel anything out right now. I am stuffed still from 3 o'clock this afternoon, and you want to go eat at 6. Well, Jesus says if you want to be blessed, you got to be hungry and you got to be thirsty, which means you got to empty out some things so he can fill you. And that's what he's been trying to talk about here. So that's how we are to live. And our attitudes make a big difference in our Christian life. They determine how effective you will be for Christ. Because if you have a bad attitude, if you're self-focused, which is sin to focus on yourself and not on Christ, you won't be looking for opportunities that he gives you in a daily time. Lots of ministry opportunities these days. Maybe just to encourage someone. Maybe just to... And, and be careful. Let me state this again. Be careful about all the nonsense on Facebook, you know. Um, we're not enemies, you know, but it seems like again and again we're divided over and over and, and people put hot topics out there just to stir things up. Be careful on those things because you may close a door to someone that you don't realize is watching your post that knows you go to church, that knows you're a Christian, and then they see something and that turns them off. You want to be really careful and use every platform that you have. So this fourth beatitude Jesus tells us that we got to remain in hot pursuit of God. And whenever I hear that word hot pursuit, I think back of the great religious movie, Smokey and the Bandit. Okay? Y'all remember Jackie Gleason, Sheriff Buford T. Justice behind the car? And what does he say when he's chasing the bandit? I'm in hot pursuit after the bandit. Well, when I think of that word hot pursuit, when Jesus wants us to be in hot pursuit... He wants us to be in hot pursuit after his righteousness. And he says, if you'll do that, you'll be blessed. He puts it another way. If we hunger and thirst for righteousness. You know, the Holy Spirit lives inside of all of us. The lukewarm Christian and the one that's on fire. Which one can he do the most through? What does Jesus say in, John, in Revelation 3 about the lukewarm Christian? He says, God wished that... You were either cold or hot. He'd spit you out. He inhabits all his people, but he can't do things with an apathetic Christian, a passive saint that's only worried about, I got into heaven and that's all I need to do. You won't have the peace and the joy and his power available because you quench the Spirit. Yes, the Spirit always lives inside of you once you get saved, but his opportunity to use you and work through you can be quenched, can be stopped at a moment by your attitude, and your attitude's got to be changed. It's got to be like Christ's attitude. The Lord doesn't reward a lazy Christian, an apathetic Christian. So when you think of yourself, would you say that you are one that's on fire? I've heard a lot of people during this time say, oh, Jimmy, I just love Sunday because here's my lineup. I start with Charles Stanley in the morning, I go to David Jeremiah, and then I go to this one and this one, and then you at the end. I'm like, well, you really ought to start with me at the beginning, and then it'll be like the opening act. You know, the, always, the opening act of a band, as you know, is usually not as good as the ones following. So you want to start out with that one and kind of build on those things. And they're excited about what's happening right now because they're getting to spend so much time of what's taking place. And God wants us to hunger and thirst for righteousness. There's a um, retired editor that was a really good friend of mine, and George, he's still a friend, but we hadn't gotten to speak in a long time. And his name's Gerald Harris. And he's pastored churches, and he's done a lot of things for the Christian community. And he retired, I think, two years ago. And one of his last posts, he talked about, in the world, think about this. If we posted this on the news every morning instead of these other numbers, in the world, 25,000 people, 25,000 people right now in the world die every day of hunger. 25,000. Over 80,000 people were killed by the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Every four days, more people are killed by hunger than they were that bomb. 
every four days. And you think about the abundance, the stuff we throw away, and things like that. We, we know about hunger, but we don't know about it especially the way we need to. And in America, we have so much stuff, but it's a sad fact for the Christians that many of them live every day just like those hunger for food. They go hungry without God. They settle for the crumbs of this world instead of feasting on His Word and seeing what He has to say to them. He has something fresh and new for you every day. And this not only results in the loss of your joy and your blessing that you get from the, the Lord Jesus Christ, it, it Kills the church. You ever had somebody come into your house or you're gathering around and everybody's all excited and here comes the party pooper? And you ask that question you should never ask. Well, how you doing? Oh, let me get my list out and tell you. First of all, my shoe broke. My cat ran away. My breakfast I burned. You know, I've got this knot on my neck and it's just, and here comes the list of all those things. And you're just like, why did I ask that question? I wish I'll learn. And so next time you see him, what do you do? You find the arrows in Walmart that go the other way. <laughs> and you go that way. Or you just say it real quick. Hope you're doing good. And you move on. Nobody likes to get bogged down with someone that's, that's miserable all the time that's ineffective and powerless. And that's what the church has become because people's attitudes aren't the attitudes of Christ. You know, we're being asked a lot of uh, questionnaires today of what's happening to the church of Jesus Christ during this pandemic, what's happening prior to the pandemic, that the churches are on decline, and our denomination has the least of all declines, but it's still in a decline. And why is that happening? It's, it's happening because of anything else. Why does a yard go from being pretty green to brown and having weeds everywhere? It's neglected. Why does a Christian go from being on fire to someone who just is very passive and doesn't have any energy or power to do anything for the Lord? It's because they, they've cut off the power. They've become lethargic. They've lost their first love. They're not Christ-centered anymore. They're self-centered. In our churches, we bring that into the church, and the churches die. And there's a fine balance between growing inside disciples and going out. And a lot of churches, I think God is shaking up at this time saying, hey, you've been focusing all on you, and I want you to focus out there. It's time for you to get out there and do those things. So part of the problem is lack of spiritual hunger. That's one of the reasons that there's going to be a big difference in the landscape of how we do church and churches in the future. God's shaking those things up. And he always says that judgment starts with his house first. The Lord's telling us that we've got to be hungry and thirsty for a deeper spiritual life. And like I said, many of us know about hunger and thirst. How many of y'all are like me? And food, I'm going to make a confession here. Food can be an idol. Can. Is. How many times are you sitting someplace and you're eating and you're already talking about your next meal? This is good, but tonight we ought to go try this. Or we'll, we'll get through this. You know, I cook this, but, you know, wait till next time I grill. I'm going to do this, and we do this. We're already talking about some things like that. You know, billions are spent on diets. That's a big industry right now. People are trying to figure out um, how to lose weight, how to do all these things, and that's great. Billions are spent on trying to feed the hungry, but we hadn't solved that. And what the Lord's telling us in this spiritual passage here is that our attitude, when we walk with God instead of the world, we become hungry for Him. He says, if you fill up on the junk food of the world, you're never going to be hungry for me. So we're to pursue something. What are we to pursue? He says in Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of heaven and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. There's that word righteous again, you know that he talks about. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will become filled. So what is he talking about righteousness? He's speaking of the perfection of God, of filling your life and your spirit with the things of God. Jesus linked righteousness to his kingdom. He says, are you hungry for my kingdom? Are you hungry for the deeper things that I have? Or are you filling up on junk food and you don't need me anymore? Before he comes back, he says there's going to be a great apostasy in the church. That people are going to make choices to walk away. 
And we see a little bit of that today, don't we? We see people that are making choices that, you know, as I said, the church is the most contagious place in the world, but nowhere else I'm worried about it. And, and they, they feed on those things. And Jesus is saying to us, be hungry and thirsty for me. We're to live a kingdom life based on his righteousness. And when we do that, we'll love differently, we'll serve differently, we'll care differently, and we'll act differently. So how do we do that? How do we seek his righteousness? It's not by trying to do better. Anytime you try and do better and seek God through works, we know you're going to fall short on that. And it's going to cause frustration because you'll get upset with yourself and say, I just can't do this. I'm a failure. And what God doesn't want you to do is try it in your power. He wants you to try it in his power. To do something on a higher plane, it becomes harder and harder. You know, you can tell a child not to touch something, and what do they do? And here's, here's an example of grown child today. The government or somebody issues a statement, and they say, you can't go in here without a mask. And I see people instantly go, Psh, I ain't getting my money. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I'm not doing this thing. And they just instantly buck up at any authority that they're given. I, you know, live down here at the corner. There's a big stop sign there. Not many people stop. Even this one across from the office. I mean, it's like a speedway. I'll be walking across the road, and I'm like, surely they see that stop sign as they go flying by. And what is it? What does the law do? It gives us a suggestion, but it can't stop us from doing anything. The same is true with what Jesus is teaching about morally, ethically, and spiritually. He says, these are your guidelines. I can't force you to do those. You're going to have to make a choice. You're going to have to pursue those things. So how can I be different? I can be different by uh, what Christ is pointing to, that we can know the joy of living by getting closer to him. The closer I get to him, the more I act like him. Um, you, I remember as a little boy watching my dad mow the yard, and I just thought that was the greatest thing in the world. And he teased me on that. I'd go out there, and I'd want to grab the mower behind, in between his hands and him pushing. Said, Son, you're not ready for this. This is, this is a man's job. So I'd sit in a chair, and I'd watch him mow, and he knew what he was doing. He's baiting me. And he had to wait till my mom left for me, him to be able to pull this off. And so one day when my mom was gone, I walked out there, and I go, am I big enough to mow today? He says, I don't know. Let's see. And so I started mowing, pushing, and he says, yeah, you're doing good. Just go back and forth. Do that. Well, he goes and gets a big glass of tea and sits down. And he's monitoring me. And uh, I got through. He says, you know, I almost stopped you. But, I get, you know, I felt like you needed to learn. So he says, next week we'll have another lesson. And here I am. I'm all excited all week long. I'm going to get to mow myself without him. Well, you know how quickly that died. I was baited like many of you dads have baited your boys. Oh, yeah, you can't do it yet, but it's going to be good. You know, when Paul spot spoke about knowing Christ. He says there's a difference in know, to know Christ and knowing Christ. And that's the difference up here in our head and in our heart. And he says this in Ephesians 3. He says, to me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for the ages has been hidden but God created for all things. So this process Paul was speaking of, he says it relates to the act of dying to yourself and fully living to Christ, to understanding who you are compared to who he is. Actually dying to self, one discovers how to actually live. When you realize that those things in your life that are coming up empty, that aren't filling you, that are still making you hungry and thirsty, after a very short time, you learn how to live, that God's power is the true experience that you need. That's how a Christian if, uh, increases their effectiveness. We're honest with God. The biggest problem with a lot of us, though, and a lot of people that don't want to come to Christ, is they don't want to die to self. They don't want to come off the throne. So here's what we're told to do. We're how we're told to pursue. He says, hunger and thirst after my righteousness. And that word hunger isn't talking about a snack or what we do during the day where we kind of feel like it was used when he, when after his baptism, he went into 
the wilderness. It's the same thing. He fasted for 40 days, that ideal of hunger. Have you ever gone through, many of us have never experienced that ideal of going through so long where we're starving to death. We're actually hungry in our stomachs. There's this show on right now called Alone. I don't know if any of y'all been watching it on Netflix, but they basically dump people on an island and you got to learn how to survive, okay? And you go out on this island and there's all these guys that say, I'm a survival expert, I'm, I'm this and that, you know? Uh, kind of like Garrett over here, they're always showing off these big muscles and they're talking about how tough and manly they are. And then about day two, they're calling on the radio because you're by yourself. And you're supposed to document your survival techniques. And they're like, I cut myself with the saw. Would you come get me? I need out of here. And they come get them. We weren't meant to live alone. We weren't meant... Uh, they, they starve because it's, <laughs> they have to fish, they have to hunt to get their food, and they are experiencing true starvation for the first time. And Jesus says when you understand what true starvation is in the spiritual world, you will hunger, you will fast for me, and you will be filled. I can't imagine not eating for 40 days. Many people can't imagine eating for 40 minutes. It's kind of extreme that you would feel. But that's how we're to have a deeper relationship. We're to clean out all the stuff, the junk food in our lives, and to hunger for this relationship that we have with Him. To thirst. How many of you ever been in a position where you're dying for water? It's been really hot this past week outside, and that cold water just seems to just quench your thirst. The older you get, you got to keep water by the bed because in the middle of the night, you got to have a drink of water in the middle of the night. Your throat gets dry and things like that, and your mouth begins to swell and crack, and your throat burns, and you desire a drop of that, that liquid. That's the kind of thirst Jesus is looking for. If we don't have that burning thirst and that gnawing hunger for a deep relationship, we're in trouble. All the things that we go through in life, you can't survive those on us, in our flesh. They have to be uh, filled with what Christ promises. And the last thing here, he gives us that promise. He says, if you will hunger and thirst after me, if you'll clear your, your mind and your heart of all those things you've been trying to fill it for, and you will search me, and you will hunger and thirst after me, you will be filled. The word filled means to be stuffed. And I know a lot of us love that word. We love to walk away from a place going, I am stuffed. You know, they got these new belts out. I don't know if you guys know about them, but if you don't, you need to get one. It's a ratchet belt, okay? And what it is, is after you've had a little too much, you hit this button and it releases like a crank strap. And so you can be filled after you get through eating and you're like, boy, my pants are tight. I don't know if I'm going to make it home. And you hit that button and zip. And you're like, I'm going to be okay. Maybe I can go back and get a second plate. It's releasing is what it's doing. But Jesus says he promises that you'll be filled, that you'll be stuffed. You know, I've had a lot of stuff during this previous time before this, this year started that was filling up my box. You know, hospital visits, different things, checking on folks, which are all great things, which are all things I don't mind. But with everything being closed where you can't go do all the visits and things like that, I've just been spending time in my office reading, just spending time with the Lord. I'm going to tell you, Tuesdays, probably in there, 12 to 14 hours. I usually leave here about midnight or a little later. I film the, the Wednesday night Bible study there, but it's just me. And I'm going to tell you, I have been filled on those days. I have been stuffed on those things. And it may not come across to you, but I walk out of that office, and it's just like I have gone into the Holy of Holies, with my Lord today and this week. And I feel I'm exhausted mentally from reading and stuff like that, but I feel like I have spent more time with him than I ever have in this last six months in my whole life. All the busyness has been pushed aside. And I understand what this passage says, that when you hunger and thirst, and that's what I do, I have all these different books, and I'm trying to figure out what this guy is saying about Revelation, which all of them are different but I'm sitting there and I'm just digging and digging and I'm like, okay, Lord, which way are we going this week? What do you want to do? And he'll lead me here and he'll lead me here and then he'll lead me off on something totally different for Sunday and then we'll come back and it's just like this one-on-one -on -one professor sitting in there with me 
and I'm at his feet, and I feel like I'm on that mountain seeing him teach. And I'm just blown away by all his words. And I walk away from that night, and I'm just like, this is just the greatest night of my life this week because I'm full. And what happens is I, out of that overflow each day, things change in my life. I start to act more like Jesus. Not all the time. I mess up. I say things I shouldn't say, do things I shouldn't do. But have you ever eaten until you've been stuffed? And I'm not talking about food. I'm talking about the Word. Spent so much time in it that you walk away and you're like, that, that little nugget I got today from the Lord, just it filled me. It absolutely filled me. You know, there's two things we need to consider regarding God's promise. Number one, it pleases you, he says. There's a lot of things that promise to please you in this world, but not many of them will. They're short-term, okay? They're very short-term. We don't want to give, you know, I think of, of a father saying, hey, I want to take you to the nicest restaurant ever. And there was a true story that went around a couple of years ago about a father that gave his daughter some cheap jewelry, some costume jewelry, and it just became a prized possession to her. And as she was getting older, he went and bought a real diamond ring. And she would take this ring off, her fake plastic costume jewelry, and she would stick it in a box by her bed, a little bitty girl. And he would go in there each night, and he says, can I have that? And she would say, no, Daddy, that's, that's special. He goes, oh, I, I may have something better. She goes, oh, no, Daddy, this little ring's special. You gave it to me. And she would look at it, and it was just so special to him. And then finally, one day, he went in there, and she was crying. And he says, what's going on? And she says, you've asked me for my month now for my ring. And, Daddy, I love you so much. I'm going to give you the thing that means the most to me. And that's this ring, because you've asked for it. And so she gives that little cheap ring he reaches in his pocket and he pulls out this big, beautiful diamond ring that he's bought her. It's real. It just blows that other one away. And she's excited and she's jumping around. She goes, oh, Daddy, Daddy, why didn't you tell me sooner? He says, because you wouldn't have enjoyed it until you released the other. God says you won't enjoy the things of his until you release the other. The fake stuff, the costume stuff. He says, I've got something so much better for you. And when you're willing to give those things back to me, I'm going to put in your hands something much better. Let's all stand. Are you hungry? <laughs> How do you eat with a mask on? Anybody figure that out? You got to take it off? Or do you get two and open it up like a bird's beak and, and go in between those? Um, thank you for being here this morning. I pray during this time that instead of looking at all the negative stuff, look at the positive. Look at the opportunities that you have to spend time with your family and make this the best summer that you've had, that you're able to spend more time with the Lord, that all the, the things that are in our life that are stealing our attention are gone, and then it's just your opportunity to spend more time with him. Let's uh, close in prayer. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's where it starts. you got to be poor in spirit. you got to understand that you bring nothing to the table, that he brought everything from the cross for your salvation. If you'll kneel to him, if you'll confess him as Lord and Savior, he will save you. That's where it all starts. And from that point on, he takes you on a journey. It's an amazing journey, not one that you would plan sometimes, but that he's got a perfect plan for you. God, as we close this service this morning, again, we're grateful for how you fill us, for the thirst that you give us for your word, and you tell us that you are fountains of living water, that if we'll take that cheap thing that we hold in our hands so dear and turn it over to you, you'll give us something of greater value because you love us that much. I pray for all the church folks around the world right now that you would just comfort their hearts, calm any anxiety in their lives, 
and that they would hunger and thirst for you because as they do that, all the cares of the world would be pushed out and they'll become content and they'll see the favor you have on them. For those that may have walked away because of a hardness in their life, something happened, draw them to you. Just let us celebrate today the little things that you do in our lives. It's in your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Any decisions you need to make this morning, staff will be down front. have a seat for a second we got a little business up here to do again um, as you walk out our ushers will be out there we're not passing the plate at this time and so if you have an offering to give if you want to give to the school project weren't able to uh, just mark that on your envelope and we'll take that today also but again thank you for being here thank you for everything and the encouragement that you bring me and we have uh, y'all joining the youth group right this young couple's coming today. They want to join the church, and um, we will kick back, uh, hopefully, in September to our Sunday school. That's when our new uh, material starts in September. We're going to try and get that going. We were planning on August, but things just didn't, don't seem right right now. And so we're going to give it, let the schools open up and give it a little bit more time. And they even came up one day for Sunday school, and, and we didn't have it, but we're excited that they're joining today and I'm going to get Tracy to introduce them. You can see if it makes it, you can throw that out in just a minute. Come on up. This is Mrs. Linda and Cecil Childs, is that right? All right, and uh, they're coming today to join our church and if you are excited about that, will you just uh, give them a big amen? <laughs> now, we normally do a meet and greet at this time, but we will probably skip that today <laughs> just for social distancing purposes. But um, if you guys want to wave at them or if you know them personally, just, you know, come, um, you know, wave them. <laughs> Why don't you take them by the back door? So okay. All right. As everybody exits, make sure you welcome our new brother and sister. They've been coming here for a long time, and uh, God's spoken to their heart about this. So I'm going to ask you to stand at this time, Doc. Thanks for the song. Thank you for joining today. You guys go with Tracy. 
And we'll, we'll bring you back in here in a minute to get your stuff. Bradley. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we come today just, again, so thankful for this for the service and, and for the message that you provided for us, Lord. Uh, thankful for this couple that decided to join us, Lord. I just pray that as we go out to our own mission fields that you present, you know, someone in front of us this week that we can share the gospel with and, and share what you're doing in our lives. And I just pray for safety as we go out and, you know, let us return uh, at the next point an hour. I pray all these things in your holy name, Lord. Amen.